So I'm excited to be giving this talk. Uh, I, about, I don't know, maybe eight, nine, ten years ago, I wrote a talk called Explain the Postgres Query Optimizer, and many of you may have seen that. I've delivered it about 20 times at different conferences, and it basically unlocks uh, the basics of the optimizer, the idea of when to use indexes and what type of joins to use and so forth, how the limit clause impacts the queries. Uh, again, if, if you're curious, please take a look at that talk. Uh, there's some recordings of that talk on the website if you want to watch them. Uh, all of my presentations are actually right at this URL here uh, with a nice fancy QR code, so if you're curious about it. There's a 58 different talks at that website and over 100 videos of, of those talks and 600 uh, blog entries uh, related to Postgres. So a lot of stuff there. So again, I wrote that talk about eight, nine, ten years ago. And I've always wanted to do a follow-up to it because, yeah, index choice is important and, uh, you know, different types of joins are the basics of relational uh, systems, but there's 43 other things the optimizer can do. And I, I kind of struggled to figure out how I would express that in a talk. And finally, basically, during COVID, <laughs> I think I was home long enough uh, to basically figure out how to, how to coalesce it. Um, obviously, as you know, talks have ramped up again. I'm on a 26-day trip that started in India and, and then Dubai, so I'm here again. Uh, this is my last stop, so that's cool. Uh, but I have Malta coming up and uh, Chicago coming up uh, in April. Um, I'm doing something in Cleveland and then Vegas, and uh, we got the big Ottawa conference coming up, so a lot of cool stuff. Um, maybe, maybe London in, in the summer, just got a, a request for that today. So again, a lot of stuff going on, Postgres uh, conference markets heated up and Postgres obviously is red hot. Uh, but today I want to talk about effectively the things beyond the, the beyond indexes and beyond joins and that's why I, I titled this. So this is, this is what the previous talk covered and again there at the URL uh, telling you exactly what the, what the previous talk was about. Uh, but this is what this talks about, okay? Um, I told you it was going to be overwhelming, and, and I, when I did this slide, I was somewhat overwhelmed. Uh, what I've tried to do here is to break the, these 43 items or 42 items up into sections. Um, so by color, you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about in these, um, in these various items here. Um, but I think there's a wealth of really interesting things coming in this uh, talk. A lot of things that you kind of heard about or you've, you've, you've heard mentioned, but you really weren't quite sure what it was. And, and you might think, well, I'm like, maybe I'm exaggerating, but I showed this talk to several of our optimizer uh, experts in the community. And they basically, I asked them to verify, is this accurate and am I missing something? And they said, you know, he said, it looks, you know, it, it passes the smell test, but I'm not quite sure about all of, the, <laughs> all of the things here, which basically told me that there may not be anybody who really understands every one of these operations. Uh, it's kind of separated out across multiple people, um, and my goal here is to kind of bring them all together. And we're going to start out really simple um, with, with the result uh, node, we call it, and the result option. Uh, but as you get into some of the window functions and the parallelism, uh, common table expressions and so forth, it, it, gets, it gets pretty complicated and I think, I think you'll find it quite interesting. So let's get started. Again, I'll take questions as we go and hopefully I can hear you and repeat the question. Um, we do have some controls for these. So the, the optimizer has ways of being controlled uh, either at the uh, globally, in, at the Postgres conf level or by session or by transaction. Uh, this group here at the far left, top left, these are the, the options I covered in my previous talk. The middle section are the options we're going to cover today, so these options over here and these, and then finally down here. I'm not covering these. I am working on a partitioning talk, uh, which will be delivered first, I believe, in Chicago in April, so I'm, I'm excited about that. The slides are not on my website yet because I haven't given the talk yet. Uh, so again, look, look for that coming in April, and I'll cover many of these, uh, these last items. So again, you know, kind of beefing up uh, the material that we have uh, available for people to understand what the optimizer does. 
So let's start with number one. Uh, that's the result node. Uh, pretty, pretty simple. We've got a, basically a constant here that we're retrieving, and it just basically has a result. Now, what I have used here is a special version of explain that is using um, a special PSQL macro capability. Uh, there is a PSQL talk, I think, going on over there. But anyway, um, basically all it does is it, it gives me the explain result without showing me any costs, because I don't, I don't need to see the cost for this talk. Uh, and secondly, kind of interesting, and again, uh, a, a very common pattern for many of my talks, is that all of the queries you're going to see today are in the SQL link file linked here. So if you want to run this presentation in PSQL, you just, just download the SQL file, pipe it into PSQL, and on your screen, without the colors, without the banners, uh, you'll see all of the sort of data line costs. You notice it's in blue, so if you download these slides as a PDF, you just click on that, it'll, it'll, give, you the, it'll give you the SQL file, so you don't have to literally copy and paste it if you don't want to. Second one, uh, something called a value scan. This throws people off. Uh, when you do insert into and you say the word values, people think that's like a, a clause. And it is a clause in insert, but there is a values command. Uh, so what I'm actually showing you is the values command. And it basically is returning two rows, uh, a one and a two. And that's how you get the values node. Uh, uh, in this example. Again, we're only at two, we gotta get to 42 by the end, but you get the idea. The other thing I wanted to highlight here is the, the use of color in my slides. So, in this example, the blue is the cause, and the red is the result, okay? So you're gonna see that over and over again in the slides. I'm gonna say, okay, what is the cause of this result, and then I'll show you the result, okay? Um, so keep an eye on the blue, and then keep an eye on the red. Uh, function scan, this is a case where you have a function in a from clause. Uh, here is the cause right here, this function call in the from clause, and you get a function scan. Effectively, just scanning over the results of a function. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Those are pretty simple, nothing to do there. Okay, here's where it gets interesting. Incremental sort. You've probably heard of this before. You may have seen it in the release notes. What exactly is an incremental sort? Um, this is a case where you, you basically have a, a result that's partially sorted, and you want to sort the, the remaining parts of it. So you may have, you may sort, let's, in this example, we're sorting on two columns, X and Y, and I basically create a result set so that X is pre-sorted, and I want to just sort on the last part. We don't want to have to sort the rest of it. We know the first column is already sorted, and we're just incrementally sorting the rest of it, which makes sense. So here I basically said, um, let's create a table called large. I believe this is a million rows right here, and we're just going to create an index on large and the first column X. And then we're just going to add a dummy column Y on the end of it. Pretty, pretty straightforward. And then we're going, to, we're going to do a select, and we're going to order by X, which we know we can already pull ordered from the index, okay? And then Y, which technically is all null, but it doesn't know that. So it has to still perform the sort. And effectively what we get here is the incremental sort. It is sorted on X and Y, but we are indicating specifically that it is pre-sorted on X. That is our incremental sort. We're really just sorting the incremental, the additional column, which is Y, and that's what you get here. And this is a diagram, which we're going to see this type of diagram over and over again in the talk. You can see here on the left, um, all of the first column are sorted. The threes and the fours are already sorted into groups but the second column is not sorted. And what we've basically done is we've sorted that second column, and that is what an incremental sort is. Okay? Okay. Questions? Okay. Um, unique, this is, again, something you see a lot. Uh, the best way to see that is probably to use the word distinct in the target list. So we're saying give me distinct values from this uh, numbers 1 to 10, and you get a unique clause right here. Um, another way of doing that is to do a union. If you're familiar with union, if you don't use the all keyword, it will make you, give you unique results. So union without all gives unique results. So in fact, the union itself 
uh, generates a, a unique node. And the way we're basically doing that is we're taking the values, we are sorting them, and then once we sort them, all of the duplicates are going to be next to each other, and then we can just remove the duplicates in the last stage. That's kind of the simplest way to do that. Okay. Append, I remember I talked about union all as being something that does not remove duplicates, and that's exactly what I'm going to be showing here. I have select one, union all, select two, and append basically does exactly what it says. It just puts the one result on the end of the other result, just appends it to the end. And you can see we've got our two result nodes. Remember, result node was, was the first node we talked about. So it takes the two of them, appends them together, and gives you that result. And here's an example. I have some results here. I have results here. They're in any order. And I'm just appending the two on, on the end of each other. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, merge append. <laughs> uh, this is one uh, you're like, uh, what is this about? Um, it has the word append in it. It has the word merge in it. Now, it's not related to the merge command that Magnus talked about, so you can, you can just get rid of that idea right there. Um, but you hear merge append a lot when, I, when you see at the nodes or we're talking about stuff. What is a merge append? Uh, what a merge append does is it takes two result sets that are sorted and kind of merges them together, right? So think of, here's an example. I have a values clause, one and two, and I've ordered them. I've got a second values clause, three and four, and I've ordered them. I've appended them. Remember, I'm using union all, so I'm not getting rid of my duplicates. Okay, we're, we're kind of, there's three clauses here. We talked about values already. We talked about union all already. And now I'm going to say order them. Okay, so my first result set is ordered right here. Um, right here, I've already ordered them with this order by. I've, re I've ordered this group with this sort right here. Now I just want to append them together. And how do I append them together in a way that I retain the ordering of the two result sets? That's what a merge append does. It's basically merging sorted results uh, together. And effectively what happens here is I've got two result sets. I sort them, okay, and then I do a merge append. And again, here's my red showing me what to do. And you can see the three, the two goes here, the three goes here, but then it notices that this four is higher than the three, which is the lowest value. And the next, so that three moves up. Now this six is too high. Now we do the four, and then we do the six, and then we bring the six up. So you see I'm kind of doing a merge uh, this is effectively the way we do a merge in, um, you know, in SQL. We kind of merge them together. Um, but we retain the ordering, and we don't have to resort the results. We've already done that before. So that's what a merge append does. Okay. Any questions? Great. Okay. Um, we're in a new section now. Now we're talking subquery scans and something called hash set op. You're like, well, okay. Um, hash set op is effectively the way that we implement uh, the clause called accept. Uh, that's also, I believe, called subtract in Oracle. Uh, and, but accept is the SQL standard way of doing that. So um, this is a stupid query. I mean, I've got a thousand rows, and I'm basically querying the, that table, and then I'm, ex I'm removing every one of the same rows. So it's a silly example. Um, but effectively, what we do here is we, sub we, we have one query uh, what would you call a subquery scan, and we scan this small table here, and we label it with a special number, I guess. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. We call that one, and then we take the second part, we call that two, and then we run it into something called hash setup, except which basically removes the ones from the other. So I'm giving you this diagram. I'm sorry, it's a little small, um, but effectively, here's my one right here. Here's my two, and what I do is I um, append them together, just append, so you can see all the ones here are appended uh, to the numbers, and here's all my twos, <coughs> and then I actually load them into an in-memory hash with a count, and I can see how many, which L1s ones I have, <coughs> I'm sorry, which sevens I have, which threes I have, and so forth all the way down the line. And what I do except, I want all of the ones that do not have a two. 
right? Because remember, I'm doing except. So I want all of the ones, meaning all of the first query, where I don't also have a, va a matching value in the second query, right? And we're doing this with a hash. And effectively, we find that 7 and 12 are the only two entries that don't have, that have a 1 but not a 2. Now, having a 2 but not a 1 doesn't help me at all. So, the, for example, there's a 11, 2, but again, that doesn't help me because it's, we're only worried about 1s that aren't in 2. Um, and there's some text down here. If you're really sort of geeky about things, uh, feel free to read this. It talks about... Remember I talked about the keyword all and it removes duplicates. There's actually some interesting analysis here of when you rem what, at what stage are you removing the duplicates? Are you removing duplicates before you put them into the, uh, into the hash or into the accept clause or after? So again, that sound, might sound silly, but in fact, there's some analysis of which stages that happen. Um, it's kind of, I found it very interesting anyway. Um, set up, set up is, the, is similar to hash op, but it's the way we do intersect. Intersect meaning you have to have both the first and the second matching values. Uh, so we do the same shenanigans here. We, we label ones and we label twos here. Um, and then uh, we basically do the same thing. Here we go, we label the ones, we label the twos. But instead of putting into a hash, we actually sort it. And then we basically look for cases where we have uh, a one and a two together, which is what we have here. And we don't have that anywhere else. We have to have a one and a two together. And then it looks like we have it here as well. So again, we have uh, set op tells me my intersect with the two. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Materialize. That's uh, this is a big one. You hear this all the time. Um, what is a materialize? Well, a materialize is effectively taking a particular result and materializing it in memory. So instead of us going to shared buffers to pull the rows, we feel that we're going we're to be scanning this result so often that we want to get it out of shared buffers where we have to lock sometimes to view things and lock the buffer we're reading it. And we just want to bring it into memory and do the, do the operation this way. And in a not equal case, you can imagine why you need to do that because you're having to compare almost every value to every other value. Yes, Chris. Uh, question to you, uh, what is the disk So the question is, will this fill the disk if the materialize doesn't fit? Um, some, basically, it's going to look at work mem to decide if it has enough memory to do that. Um, Basically, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and then we'll, we're going to run it. And I believe we're just going to run as much memory as we need because we kind of know how big the result set is. Um, I don't believe this one, I don't think materialized spills to disk. I would have to look at that. I can't remember. Some of our operations, some of the hashes, for example, we'll do things in batches. Or we'll spill the hash to disk and then we'll load it and we'll run it in batches. I don't think that does that, but I didn't get into the detail to really understand that. Good question, though. Other questions? Okay. Um, this is the again crazy diagram, but what we're what you're noticing is because we're doing not equal, we have to compare every row to every other row. It's incredibly expensive, um, but again, we don't want to be accessing shared buffers for that little result all the time. So we just materialize the shared buffers into memory, and then we just perform the join that way in local memory. Okay, that's what pretty much materialize does. Uh, this one, yeah, this one's crazy. Um, we spent a huge amount of time in Postgres 14, like deciding what memo, what, like the word memoize just like freaked us out. Um, supposedly this is the right word. I don't know why, but uh, memo, memo, I, I always, it's just a funny word. I've never heard it before. Um, but supposedly this is the word that actually describes what we're doing. Um, and it confuses a lot of people because you don't hear that word very much. What is it? It's like a memo, like a sticky note. No, it's, it's something. I don't know what it is. But effectively, you can see from the comments when memoize is used. Memoize is used when you have a lot of duplicates, um, but it's too small to basically create a hash join. 
um, and hash join again is covered in my previous talk. And also a case where the other side of the join is too big for hash join. So you've got this weird, it sounds like a very small use case, but there actually are a lot of cases where people use this. What I'm basically creating here is a table with a lot of duplicates. All right. Um, and here I'm creating a huge table. And here I'm creating an index on the, uh, this, this medium table, this very big table here. And effectively what I'm doing, I'm joining the small table to the big table. And here, bingo, you see the word memoize. Um, we only actually use memoize for nested loops. Um, it, we might, it, I don't know if it makes sense any other, any other case, and I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, but again, feel free to look at this URL. This is a nice blog entry about memoize I found really, really helpful. Um, so what memoize does, remember I talked about materialize, where we bring in results and we kind of materialize it in memory. Well, if you have a big table, you can't do that. Right? So what Memoize does um, is to basically have like a, a local memory cache of, remember we, I, I mentioned there would be a lot of duplicates. So have an in-memory cache and effectively load the cache every time we need a value that we don't already have in the cache. Now the cache is clearly more, bigger than two entries, but to fit on the slide, we had to just use two entries. Um, so what we're doing here is we want to join the outer side to the inner side, but this is too big to bring into memory completely, and we have a lot of duplicates, so we're just going to load, the, load them as needed, basically. Okay? And we basically join, okay, we need AG, AK, whatever, and we basically just kind of load it in. If, it, if the value isn't in our cache, we then go to the main shared buffers to find it. And if it's not there, there's no join. If, there, if it is there, we push out the least recently used cache entry, and we put it into our memoized cache, and then we keep going. And because there's a lot of duplicates, we think we're going to reuse that cache later. Jan, yeah. If you now here have the duplicates in the outer or AAK, would it do the memoized cache Uh, so the question is, if there's duplicates over here, would it, know, would it keep looking in shared buffers over and over again on a non-match? Yeah. On a non-match. If there's a match, it's going to know. You're basically saying, is there, a, is there a negative cache here, which would say, I looked this up recently, and I don't have it. I do not know the answer to that. That's a good question, right? Um, we do have some caches that have negative entries, which grow forever, frankly, uh, which we've been wanting to fix. Um, but I don't know how the negative cache entries work in this case. Yeah, great question, though. Other questions? Yeah, so that's memoize. I know a lot of people, are, even in the community, are like, uh, blah, 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 wrote it, and it works really well, and he says it's really useful, but I don't really understand why it works or why we use it. Or, and it seems like it's a really limited use case, but there's a lot more cases than you would think that actually can use memoize. That's what I've been, that's what I've been told. Okay, okay um, now we're going to move shift gears again. Uh, we're going into group. I did not know before this talk that you could do a group by with no aggregates in it, in the query. Who knew? Um, what, we're, what group by dust basically does now, you know you can do distinct in the target list, but what group by does, it allows you to do distinct in a way that is independent of what's in the target list. So if you, have a, if you want to do distinct of certain columns, and then you want to return other columns that aren't necessarily distinct, you can kind of use group by. I've never used this before, but I was shocked that this actually worked. Um, and again, um, it, it, actually, it actually is kind of interesting. Um, here's, a, here's another example. Um, this one is basically less than zero. It causes it, and this one is just an order by. Again, it uh, doesn't group by. The way it works effectively is it just coalesces or combines adjacent sorted values and just returns one of them. Okay, um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, in this case, it's grouping all the columns and again, uh, here's group by without aggregates is similar to extinct, except duplicate deletion 
uh, detection is, um, can consider more columns than those which are included in the output. So again, um, as with a lot of my slides, you may find that you want to go back and look at some of this little text at the bottom. Um, in fact, somebody complained uh, I'm gonna, uh, a month ago that some of my slides were simpler now and there wasn't enough of this like Easter egg stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 you haven't seen my, some of my newer presentations. So yeah, feel free to kind of read some of this stuff here at the bottom uh, to understand more and play with it. Uh, this is a case a little clearer where, again, I'm grouping by more columns than I'm actually returning. All right, so again, I'm grouping by and then I'm, I'm getting this result here. Okay. All right, aggregate, everyone knows what this is. Uh, account aggregate gives me this right here. Uh, here's, um, again, another one, group aggregate. This is the aggregate with the group by. Again, very, very similar. Everyone understands that. And again, here we have same thing, except now I'm grouping multiple rows. I'm returning the, the group by value, which is this. And then I'm re also returning an aggregate value, which could be sum, could be count, could be standard deviation, average, whatever. Uh, but I'm, I'm returning the value I'm grouping by plus an aggregation of those. And again, here's the same thing here and the same thing here. Okay. Hash aggregate, this is uh, kind of interesting. You hear this one a lot. Typically, you see it with the distinct keyword. Um, and effectively, all we're doing is we're taking the uh, value on the left and we're just hashing it and we're finding all the unique uh, values over here. And that's what we're doing, right? So that's what we're basically distincting on the first column we're getting that okay um, roll up uh, this is a uh, this is again you might need to look at my other presentation uh, which talks a little bit more about roll up uh, but effectively um, this bears something called a mixed aggregate and what this does is it gives me it allows me to roll up uh, multiple entries into a hash and then obviously re return an aggregate out the difference is that the result is sorted Previously, our result was not sorted, it was just, a, just random coming out. Uh, here we have a sorted result, and we have to do that because of the way roll-up works and the way we have to, do, we have to, to return those results. Uh, window ag, again, if you love window functions, there's a, a, an interesting <laughs> presentation that I did about window functions. <clears throat> very, very complicated talk. Um, I will be actually giving that talk in a week or two um, as a webinar, actually, for my employer, EDB. So it's kind of fun. I'm, I'm going to bring that one back out. Um, but that's really a long, that's a hundred, uh, it's a lot of slides, even more than this one. Um, and what a window function does is it allows me to basically combine, it allows me to create, to generate an aggregate value without, without removing the distinctness of individual rows. And again, take a look there if you're more interested. But window functions allow you to get aggregate values across rows, but not, not distill everything down to one row. You know, normally, our group by is going to shrink things down, multiple rows into one row. With window functions, the rows remain distinct, yet I can still do aggregates on them. Okay. Um, and this is a slide I think is, is pretty clear. Here's exactly what I'm saying. Window functions allow aggregate acts, um, access across rows while the individual rows remain uh, distinct. So here I'm doing the ones, group of ones, group of twos, group of threes. I have aggregates related to these groupings, but again, the same number of rows in and the same number of rows out. That's what window ag does. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, so now we're getting into overdrive here. Um, this is parallel, parallelism, uh, which is super cool. We've had it for many years, uh, but I've never actually had the time normally to study all of the different uh, node types that can occur with uh, parallelism. And I, I have basically two slides here. Uh, again, a, uh, a nice uh, reference to the Postgres docs about parallelism. Um, but here's an example of my large table where I want to do a sum and what we basically have here are two background workers, okay? Uh, and both of them are doing something called a partial aggregate. 
and a parallel sequential scan, and then they are returning the partial aggregates to something called gather, and then finally we have something called finalized aggregate, which eventually combines those. So what does that look like? I know this is, sounds really bizarre, um, but this diagram is the best I could do. We basically take the large table and we have two background workers, background worker number one, background worker number two, okay? And in parallel, we have this background worker scanning the table and processing some blocks. And I have a second background worker which is scanning the table and processing some blocks, okay? And then the first background worker is going to generate an aggregate sum for the, ro the, the rows, the blocks it processed. And it's going to generate a value. The same thing's going to happen here. It's going to generate a value. And then those values are going to be gathered by the gather node to generate, in this case, two different sums. And then finalized aggregate is going to total those together and give me a result. Isn't that beautiful, right? Now, again, this is not going to happen on a small table, but on a big table, this is impressive. This is really useful. And again, I think this is kind of cool how this parallelism works. And, and aggregate is a great, is a great example of that. Um, gather merge is a, another type of node, but instead of gathering, we are going to, remember merge append? Remember merge append? We took two result sets and we kind of got the, the low, we, from each result, we got the lowest value, we picked it, and then we just kept going and we kind of merged them in. Um, similar to the way cars, when they go into one lane, you know, they kind of zipper in like that. Except we're going to pick the lowest values as we zipper in the, um, the entries. Um, by the way, I was driving here in, in California the um, past couple of days, and incredibly polite drivers in California. And I'm not making that up. Honestly, I was, I was very impressed at how, I, I'm sorry, I, I know, I know, but I'm from Philadelphia, and I thought we were polite but people here are even more polite. So that's really wonderful to see. Um, I know many of you don't experience that, but I'm saying as a visitor, that is what I experienced. Um, so am I, am I right, Christine? Yeah, see, she's saying yes, okay. Um, so in, in Gather Merge, uh, basically what we do, and I, again, this is the best, if somebody has a better way of expressing this, I'd love to hear it. Um, what we're basically doing here is a parallel sequential scan here on the first background worker, a parallel sequential scan here on the second background worker. We've seen that before, okay? And then we're going to sort, instead of aggregating, we're going to sort the first batch in this worker. We're going to sort the second batch in this worker. And then we're going to do that same merge append process. We're going to take the least value from the first worker then the least value here, and then now this value is higher than the least value in the second worker, so we're going to take that row up, and then we're going to take the four, and we're going to basically zipper those in, giving us the lowest value. So that's what, that's what parallel um, gather merge is. It's doing that merge, like merge append, except it's doing them in gather, right? Remember, gather was how we gathered. Gather is the concept of bringing results from different background workers. It's kind of merging. It's kind of, I don't want to use the word merge again. It's combining <laughs> the two terms together, right? Merge, append, and gather. Gather, merge. It's kind, of this, it's kind of that repeated in a parallel sense, right? Kind of cool. Other questions? I was impressed. I actually understood this. I got like, wow, this looks really great. Yeah. Right, so the, the question is, where's the trade-off point where the, the number of worker, too many workers is inefficient? Um, normally what we recommend is that you look at, and again, this is kind of off topic, but I'm going to answer the question. Normally we, we would set the maximum number of workers, and we don't want to exceed the number of CPUs or the number of concurrent sessions we're going to be using. Um, and then you set the maximum and we're going to use what we think is a reasonable number. So you never really set 
You never really approach a query and say, I want 20 workers. You say, I want a maximum of 20, and Postgres is going to decide how many it should use based on your work mem, based on some other, the size of the table, and so forth. So you're not actually setting. You, you notice I never set two here, right? I did Literally, what you are seeing is exactly what I did. I, I wrote the SQL. I ran it through PSQL. I captured the output. I threw it into Lix. I colored it up. I added some headings. Bingo, presentation. So what you're seeing, there's nothing behind the scenes here. I didn't do anything here. This is literally what I got from Postgres. So again, the, the beauty is you don't really have to set, tell it how many to use. You just kind of limit so it doesn't, you just worry about it overusing and it'll figure out what it wants to use based on your settings. Yeah, but you, feel free to play with that. Other questions? Okay, great. Um, so again, gather merge, cool. Parallel append, uh, this is actually a lot simpler. All you're doing is you're taking one result set and you're appending it to the other one, right? Really simple. So we just basically do, and again, I left this slide for the end because it's a little freaky. Um, what we're doing here is we've got four background workers, right? Um, we've got four background workers here. We're doing a parallel sequential scan on the first table, and another background worker on the first table is also doing a parallel sequential scan, okay? And then another background worker is doing a parallel sequential scan on the second table and a parallel, and then a parallel sequential scan on the table, right? And then we're doing what we call a merge append, a parallel append, where we're sticking the parallel sequential scans together, which we're then sorting, okay? And then we're finally, um, we're finally doing a, a, a gather merge to bring those results back in order. Does that make sense? So I left this slide for the last, because it was the most complicated slide. Um, because we have four background workers, and what we have going on here on the left is four parallel scans of two different tables, right? Which we then append together the first table from the two scans. We append together the second table from the two scans. Then we sort it within the background worker and then we do the gather merge to bring them together. Okay. I, I will tell you it was not trivial to get all these nodes in an order that made sense. <laughs> um, but you can see we're building on stuff that we've done before and it now kind of fits together. If I started with this slide, it would have been complete chaos. Right? Um, parallel hash, parallel hash join, another kind of cool option. So here we're joining uh, the table to itself but the table is huge, so we basically do a parallel hash here. And this is kind of really interesting. Um, what we basically do, and this is kind of interesting, is we, we have a hash in shared memory. So normally when we do a hash join, um, we're going to do a hash join in local memory. But in this case, because we have multiple background workers, we have to do the hash in shared memory so all of the workers can access the hash simultaneously. So what we do <laughs> is we have, um, we have our table, we do a uh, parallel sequential scan, and we load the hash from this background worker. At the same time, we're doing another parallel scan, and we're loading the hash from this other worker into shared memory. And then once we're done, this table, this is the inner side, the outer side, and this is kind of weird because we're working this way and then we're working this way. So it, it isn't, we're, it's not linear. We're going, we're going this part first and then the way the notation works, we're kind of joining backward this way. And we're saying, okay, take the outer side and use the shared memory hash table we created and do a parallel hash join, okay? And we're basically doing a parallel hash join here. We're looking it up, and then we're re returning the results based on the match. Really like, wow, OK. Um, really interesting. Um, I had never seen this sort of visually shown. Um, but it helped me to explain it. Hopefully, it'll help you. Okay. Uh, common table expressions. I do have a common table expression talk right down here, if you're curious of what they are. Um, what I've effectively done here is create a very simple query 
that uh, is materialized, therefore it's going to cause a CTE scan. It, it, normally this query would be uh, flattened uh, and optimized, but by using the word materialize here, I'm preventing the uh, flattening. So I basically have a select source of one, and then I'm querying it right here, and we call something called a CT scan. And the way it works is we basically create an in-memory result set uh, called a CTE, a, a materialized common table expression, and then we scan that, uh, what we call CT source, is the way you see it in the code right here, CT source. Uh, so we're basically looping through. And that's pretty trivial. Uh, this is much more interesting. It counts from one to 10. Uh, or one to nine, I think. Um, no, one to 10, because we, we add one after that. Uh, nine would be 10. Um, and we basically count one to 10, and what we have is the CT scan, but we also have something called a recursive union and a work table. Um, internally, this is the way the, the query's working. It has, a, it has a primer value, and then that primer value goes to the source, and it kind of loops around like this. Again, my CT presentation uh, gives you a lot of good examples of this, but this is what's going on. And in purple here, you can kind of see that, that recursive loop going on. I kind of colored it. So we have our non-recursive primer value, in, in this case is one, and we load that into our recursive union. It goes into the work table. It then goes to the recursive common table expression. It kind of loops around. As long as the where clause is returning rows, it keeps looping around, and every time it loops around, it appends to the CT scan. Um, so this is a kind of a clear expression of exactly what's happening. Well, the way you think of these queries, they're actually appending to this source. It keeps adding, adding rows, and down here, we're returning whatever this result is that we've appended to. Okay, hopefully that's clear to you. But again, this is kind of the way it loops around until, while it's uh, true, and every time it loops around, any row that's generated goes into the CT source, and then finally at the end we scan the source. Okay. Um, I think we're in the home stretch here, uh, maybe. Project set. Uh, this is a case where we have a, fr a function call in the target list. Very early on, no, item three was function scan. Remember that one? So function scan was when I had a function in the from clause. Here I have a function in the target list. So it's a little different. It's called project set, and again, uh, returns that result. Um, if you're doing a for update, you would get a lock rows node because you're going to lock the rows that you're, you're uh, selecting, of course. If you use something called table sample, we'll, we'll generate something called a sample scan. Kind of cool. Uh, this one is just bizarre, um, and again, only uh, there's a special uh, capability we have called XML table that has a weird syntax, because XML has to, right, um, where we basically have sort of a primer up here, and then we've got this passing clause, and then this structure, and then uh, columns and ID. Again, I'm, I'm not sure why all this is needed, but that's how you get a table function a scan um, effectively in, in the query, in, in, out of the optimizer. Foreign scan, I love these things. I'm not sure how many of you have seen these before, uh, but a foreign table scan is effectively a way of having foreign data appear local to Postgres. Uh, and we basically are doing that by creating a server and then a user mapping and finally a foreign table, which will then create a foreign scan. Uh, TID scan, this is mostly for you internals folks. Uh, TIDs are ways of physically representing specific rows in Postgres tables. It's typically a page number and an item number on that page. And the way you do that is to reference an invisible column called CTID, uh, which basically allows you to access, in this case I'm accessing the first row on the first page. This is effectively what's happening. It's literally opening the file and the first 8K block and the first item pointer on that 8K block, and it's giving me uh, that row right there. So that's how it, this one right here, and then that's, that's the row that gets returned. Okay. Um, insert, I'm going to just go through, you know, these other ones which are pretty standard. 
when you generate insert, you will get an insert node. Makes sense. Um, if you do an update, you will get an update node. Um, again, makes sense. If you do a delete, you will get a delete node. Uh, be aware that truncate is not, a, uh, is not an optimized command. It's basically a, a utility command. It doesn't go through the optimizer. So therefore, you can't run explain on it. So I'm just kind of illustrating an example. The explain just doesn't work because it's similar to running explain on vacuum or explain on create index. There is no query plan. There's no optimizer output to give you and we'll throw that kind of error. Uh, merge, this is a command that Magnus talked about over there uh, earlier. This is a new command in Postgres 15. And effectively, when you use the merge command, uh, you will get a specific uh, merge output there. Okay. Uh, this one, this last two are kind of interesting. Semi-join, uh, which I never really, um, I, I don't know, I was a little hazy on this myself exactly what this is, but a semi-join is effectively a join that stops after the first match. So normally when you do a join, you're going to go through the entire result set. To, for as many matches as you have, that's how many rows I'm going to return because I'm matching multiple rows. A semi-join is basically saying I'm going to join until I get a match and then I'm going to stop. Why would you want to do that? Well, the word exists here um, is effectively uh, saying if any row exists in here, then return the outer row. Well, you don't have to look after one because you've already seen a match. So when you do an exists, it will basically do a join on a hash. And once it finds a match, it just stops and moves on to the next one. Okay, kind of cool. Uh, second example, an in clause also generates a semi join. Again, doesn't matter how many rows come out of here, either there's one or more rows or no rows. That's all you care about. You don't care how many. And here we have semi-join. And again, some ex expl explanation here. Exists an inner equivalent uh, in the handling of nulls because of uh, the way we uh, process things. Now, anti-join sounds like it shouldn't happen or it's, an, uh, it's, it's something bad. No, it isn't. Um, it's basically not exist. So not exist would be an anti-join. You're saying return this row if no rows exist from this. And again, stop scan after the first inner match and then negate the result. That's why it's an anti-join instead of a semi-join, right? Same kind of idea. A subplan is different. Um, and again, more text here talking about the fact that while in and exists are effectively equivalent with their handling of nulls, a very often overlooked issue is that not in and not exists are different in their handling of null values from this fault clause. And if you've ever had a case where you do not in and your subquery returns null, you know what I'm talking about. So again, feel free to play with that. That's why I'm putting the text there. So those of you who are writing queries, when you're using not in, if there is a null in that, in that subquery, you may want to use not exists. Okay, so just, just be aware of that. And we're on 43. This is the last one. I thought this was the coolest thing. Um, effectively, what we have here is because we have a unique index on the right-hand side of the join, and because we are using a left join, the join disappears. And I was just surprised that worked, but yay for Postgres. Effectively, because, you're, because you have a unique index, you're saying we can only return one or zero matches. One or zero matches. No, not two, not three. We don't have a problem of hitting more than once. So one or zero matches over here. And then because we're doing a left join, we say we don't care if the row exists or not. We're still going to return the row on the left-hand side, on the outer side. So we know we're going to return every row over here. And we know there's either zero or one matches over here. So why are we doing the join? And in fact, you, the optimizer disappears. The whole query disappears. I was surprised. OK, the two I didn't cover were something called name tuple store. Uh, this is used for after triggers. And then something called custom scans, uh, which is, uh, has a separate chapter in Postgres about what custom scans are. And I'll, I'll let you take a look at that. So uh, that does complete the talk. I know, again, I tried to build from simple to more complex, working through 
you know, merge append and then, mer you know, a parallel append and so forth and gather and so forth and working through all of the node types that are effectively documented in Postgres. I did this by looking at the source code, finding all the node types that could come out and then digging down and finding out exactly what would cause them and then hopefully illustrating those. Are there any questions before we finish? Yes, sir. Uh, it looked at the full result set and then um, it sh gave everything including kind of what it found within the Windows function. I was curious if that changed for Postgres 15 since it was supposed to only look at what was within the window and not the full result set. So you're talking about Postgres 15's optimization yeah. for monotomically increasing. Yeah. yeah. So they're really different cases. The window okay. function has not changed. What, what, what Magnus was talking about was effectively in unusual structures for window functions, there are cases where you know you're never going to get any more rows, and they would just stop. Um, similar to the way we do on limit. If you look at my previous talk, talk about how limit stops. So it's not a question of removing rows or anything. It's basically an optimization that Magnus is talking about, okay. where you know you're not going to get any more rows than you have already, and you just stop. Very similar to the way common table expressions work, where you have an exit clause. That's really what he was getting at, not, not anything else. Okay, cool. Yeah, Thank great. you. Great. Well, thanks very much. I think we are out of time. I wish you have a... Oh, we do have a question. One more. Sorry, Chris. Yes? Just, just a quick question. Um, memoization is really cool. Uh, my experience with it, though, is in a different context. So in relation to that, do you know if anybody is working on memoizing function calls? So is anyone working on memoizing function calls? Uh, it sounds like it's something that, that's a great question. Um, the, way, the way that I describe memoize is that we're retrieving from a table. There, I have not heard of anybody talk about doing that for function calls. It would make perfect sense, because in a lot of ways the function calls are more expensive than the, and you're saying it doesn't memoize function calls now? No, so that might be something we should look at. Anyway, um, thanks very much. I'll be here for any questions. You have a great lunch. We're back at 1.30. Yeah, that's right. Everybody give uh, Bruce a round of applause. Thanks. thanks.